Greetings, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of ATP Ask the Pastor. Pastor Sullivan here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Don't forget to check ATP out on Patreon, where uh, if you decide to uh, support ATP there, uh, you get each week's scripts and more. Also then, uh, if you'd like a searchable database of every video that ATP has ever posted, go to atp.holycrosscurville.com. Let's get to today's question. Dear Pastor, I've heard Roman Catholics claim that Luther removed books from the Bible because they taught doctrines he didn't like, such as works righteousness, purgatory, and prayers for the dead. Well, the claim that, uh, that's not really a question, first of all, uh, but yeah, the claim that Luther removed books from the Bible is disingenuous at best and uh, maliciously ignorant at worst. When Luther translated the Bible into German from Hebrew and Greek, he actually retained the apocryphal books within the Bible. What Luther did was he sequestered them in between Malachi and Matthew. So he put them in between the Testaments. Now, at first glance, this seems to be an innovation. But what we really see is that Luther was simply following uh, in the steps of St. Jerome. Jerome's biggest and greatest accomplishment was the production of the Latin Vulgate translation of the scriptures. And Jerome wrote prefaces to the books of the Bible, and in his helmeted or defensive preface to the book of Kings, Jerome writes this. This preface to the scriptures may serve as a helmeted introduction to all the books which we turn from Hebrew into Latin, so that we may be assured that, it, that what is not found in our list must be placed amongst the apocryphal writings. Wisdom, therefore, which generally bears the name of Solomon, and the book of Jesus, the son of Sirach, and Judith, and Tobias, and the shepherd, are not in the canon. The first book of Maccabees I have found to be Hebrew. The second is Greek, as can be proved from the very style. Seeing that all this is so, I beseech you, my reader, not to think that my labors are in any sense intended to disparage the old translators. So in his defensive or helmeted preface, he is defending the, what books belong truly in the canon of Scripture and which books are unworthy of that title. And Jerome clearly says that these books that we call apocryphal are not canonical. He also has this to say in his preface to the books of Solomon. Also included is the book of the model of virtue, Jesus, son of Sirach, and another falsely ascribed work, which is titled Wisdom of Solomon. The former of these I have also found in Hebrew, titled not Ecclesiasticus, as among the Latins, but Parables, to which were joined Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, as though it made of equal worth, the likeness not only of the number of the books of Solomon, but also the kind of subjects. The second was never among the Hebrews, the very style of which reeks of Greek eloquence. And one of the ancient scribes affirms this one of Jude Philo Judaeus. Therefore, just as the church also reads the books of Judah, Tobias, and the Maccabees, but does not receive them among the canonical scriptures, so also one may read these two scrolls for the strengthening of the people, but not for confirming the authority of ecclesiastical dogmas. Jerome only well, sounds remarkably like Luther or Luther like Jerome. The church reads these books, but the church does not receive them among the canon of Scripture. Their contents strengthen the faith of Christians, but they don't confirm the dogmas of the church. Now, by segregating the apocryphal books into their own intertestamental category, Luther was simply putting Jerome's teaching into practice. The sequestration of these books confessed, on the one hand, their lack of canonicity and authority, while retaining them in the Bible, on the other hand, confessed that they were and are fit for Christian edification. You know, they're good to read for exhortations to faith in God's promises, you know, especially in times of persecution, cross, and affliction. They're also uh, encouraging for the readers uh, to read for the sake of good works through instruction and the example of the godly works of the people in those books. Now, Luther also then wrote prefaces for every book of the Bible in his translation, even the apocryphal books. And in those prefaces, he calls the wisdom of Solomon a proper exposition and illustration of the first commandment, that the Christian may learn to fear, uh, learn to fear and trust God. 
He writes that uh, the book of Tobit shows how things may go badly with a pious peasant or townsman, and there may be much suffering in married life. Yet God always graciously helps and finally crowns the outcome with joy in order that married folks should learn to have patience and in a genuine fear of God and firm faith, put up gladly with all sorts of hardships because they have hope. The book of Jesus Sirach, called in Latin Ecclesiasticus, is a book on home discipline and the virtues of a pious householder. The book of 1 Maccabees, he writes, shows Christians how God delivered the Jews from their Antichrist, Antiochus IV, uh, and, and reformed the intertestamental church from his idolatry and false worship uh, that he as their Antichrist had introduced. You know, that's important for Luther because he sees the victory of, Ma- of the Maccabees as assurance that Christ would preserve his church from Antichrist in his day as well. Uh, by cleansing and reforming the church from its idolatry and false worship that had been incorporated into the Roman Mass. So Luther encouraged the use of these books uh, by including them in his German Bible, and with his prefaces, he made these obscure books much more approachable. Now, Luther's attention to the apocryphal books then also extended to the public worship of the church. So apocryphal texts, uh, when they were used in the Mass, they were generally applied or employed as antiphons for the intro. Um, however, there is one occasion of which I'm aware, uh, the Festival of St. John Apostle, in which the appointed epistle lesson is from an apocryphal text and which Luther preached on. It's from Ecclesiasticus 15, 1 to 6. And Luther preached on this text at least once in his career, uh, though we don't know when because the sermon wasn't dated. But in that sermon, on Ecclesiasticus chapter 15, um, he preaches then, according to the text, that the hearers uh, are to fear God and to love righteousness by praising the benefits of the fear of God and showing the disaster of neglecting the fear of God. So expositing uh, the apocryphal text, Luther preaches a thoroughly evangelical sermon. He begins by defining the fear of God and righteousness as faith. Uh, that this faith justifies the sinner so that all who believe have the benefits uh, which Jesus ben Sirach then outlines in the text. So Sirach begins, uh, He that feareth the Lord will do good, in verse 1. And Luther says, His works are good not because of their character, but because of the fear that inspires them. Here you see his great comfort. Immediately you abound in good works, and your whole life is good if you fear God. Now, Luther reads the first verse as a statement of fact about the believer rather than an exhortation to do good. You know, righteousness uh, cares for the one who believes and, quote, as a mother shall meet him and receive him as a wife married of a virgin, Ecclesiasticus uh, 15.2. So as bread nourishes man, so the righteousness of faith nourishes man making him daily increase in the spirit, Luther says, and grow in the knowledge of the divine and human. The righteous, in verse 4, shall not be moved and shall rely upon her and shall not be confounded. Now, Luther expounds briefly on the topic of hardships, then saying, he recognizes here that he who fears God and would be godly must encounter labors, conflict, and many misfortunes. Crosses are bound to come. And Luther concludes his sermon by noting how well the text harmonizes with the appointed gospel lesson for the day, which is John 21, 19 through 24, since it's the epistle lesson for St. John Apostle. And he writes, Here righteousness receives the individual as a virtuous mother receives her child, or the bride her bridegroom. Thus, too, Christ took John to his breast as the beloved disciple. In both selections, the nature of faith is commended and illustrated. This sermon of Luther, then, on an apocryphal text, is a singular example, and the only example uh, in in English that I'm aware of, but it demonstrates Luther's attention to the apocrypha that it carried uh, into the pulpit uh, as well when the appointed lessons presented an opportunity. This sermon also demonstrates, then, that apocryphal texts can be read evangelically uh, to encourage faith and the fruits of faith in the life of the Christian. You know, there's nothing in the apocryphal books uh, that specifically teach distinctive Roman Catholic doctrines. Uh, 
and Lutherans, Luther himself, but also Melanchthon and Gerhard and others, go to great lengths to show uh, that those passages that appear to teach works righteousness or prayers for the dead, that they can be read within their context in an evangelical way according to the analogy of faith that's found in Scripture. So by not treating them as canonical, it's not like we're cutting out doctrines that we don't like because those doctrines just aren't there. Far from removing books from the Bible, Luther sought to retain these books, but in their proper place, for their proper use. And he did this in his translation, he did this in his prefaces, and he also did this in his preaching. So, no, Luther didn't remove books from the Bible. Thanks for the question. We'll see you next time on ATP.